sponsored by the James Madison Council. Hello and welcome to everyone. My name is Bilal Qureshi. I will be the moderator of this session with the Pulitzer Prize winning author Isabel Wilkerson. Um, we will be discussing her book, uh, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, at this 2021 edition of the National Book Festival. Ms. Wilkerson, welcome to uh, the Library of Congress National Book Festival. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you. And, uh, you know, we're speaking to you, I mean, a, more than a year after your book was published. And I think it's, uh, it would not be an understatement to say that it was a book that made a huge impact and had a very um, profound effect on a lot of the people who read it. And it helped, I think, many people, frankly, understand the past year. And, and I wonder what that's like as an author to have, to have now seen this book in the world and be received the way that it was. Well, you know, it's uh, surreal because we're in an age where, uh, because of the pandemic, you know, we've been isolated from one another. You know, to have a book come out in this era where there's this veil between ourselves as authors and the, you know, the readership, um, it's so completely different than what we would be accustomed to, and, and yet we've had to persevere through it. Um, another thing is that this book was written long before we could have even imagined that there would be a pandemic, um, and yet the opening, uh, you know, opening chapter uh, situates us in a time of, of a different kind of uh, virus that was, or a different kind of pathogen, um, starting with what was going on uh, in the Siberian tundra uh, in the summer of 2016. Um, and connecting that to a more global awareness of the um, of the uh, the dangers of division that we have inherited, and so it it was quite stunning, you know, and and really uh, you know unexpected that we would actually be in the midst of a pandemic at the time this book uh, was released, that it would be released uh, just you know, weeks after uh, what we all saw happen to George Floyd, which galvanized the world um, with alarm and a desire to confront these longstanding divisions. So it's just been surreal uh, to have it out there in the world. You know, you work so hard on a book, you worked for so long in the research and then in the construction of it and then the, and the writing of it and the, the editing of it and all of the things that you go through you have no way of knowing, no way of planning uh, what the world will be like when you finish it. Uh, and so this seems to have been a confluence of the mission of the work with the uh, circumstances into which it was released. And, and I can only say that um, uh, I feel that the timing, even though it could not be planned, ended up being um, in some ways um, very inspired I've always loved the idea that writers write sometimes the books that they wish existed for themselves. And it's an opportunity to really, you know, have an intervention in a way in, in our thinking about, in this case, America and how America was set up. And of course, as you mentioned, you began this book much earlier than the pandemic and, you know, the murder of George Floyd and all the incidents that have followed. But what absence had you seen or what had you sensed was not in the air enough in terms of understanding the way America was structured. I, I want to know about the, the void that you perhaps felt as a writer that you wished to address by, by articulating this. Um, and, you know, I've always loved also in your, I think it's in your, in your Instagram profile as well. You, you say, I, I'm a, I'm a, I write about human nature, you know, and I, and I love that idea as well, but I wanted to know about what in, in our nature had you, yeah, had you felt a void about that you, that you wish to address with this book? Well, you know, the second book cast, uh, The Origins of the Discontents, uh, arises from The Warmth of the Sons, in which, you know, I'd spent 15 years uh, to research and to um, narrate um, the experience of 6 million African Americans who, in some ways, uh, they fled the Jim Crow, Crow South, but they were really defecting one part of the country for another part of the country. They were seeking political asylum within the borders of their own country. And in doing so, uh, it, you know, to be able to understand why they were doing what they were doing uh, required me to, you know, not just uh, 
you know, do the research into the archives, but to listen to the stories and experiences of the people and to find out what was it that they were fleeing. And then ultimately they were fleeing a regime that was so, so, uh, so specific and so extreme that it was against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together. Uh, was, you know, there was actually, there were, there were actually a black Bible and an altogether separate white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court and courtrooms throughout the South. And so it was a world that was so tightly uh, scripted, so uh, rigidly enforced and surveilled that any, any breach of that world, of that system, of that regime could literally mean a person's life. And that's what they were fleeing. And so that, that exposed me to the origins and the, um, the nature of the uh, both jurisprudence and the protocols that were in place in the American South, in some ways the birthplace of what I would call caste in our country, it was, it was self-evident in the experiences of the people uh, who were fleeing that world, fleeing that regime. And so after writing the book, I mean, I felt you know, that I used the word caste throughout the book. And, that, and then as, as uh, we enter the, the world that would ultimately um, propel uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and I would suggest that begins with, with Trayvon Martin, uh, the killing of J Trayvon Martin, then there, there was a, this was a reintroduction, it was a reintroducing to all of us of, a, of the kind of protocols and the, uh, the, uh, the things that could be done to this group in particular. And uh, there was something about the case of Trayvon Martin that really, um, that will touch everyone obviously, but especially for me, because uh, where Trayvon Martin was from, uh, where, where he was killed was the same part of Florida that one of the protagonists of, of uh, The Warmth of the Suns was from. And so it was a place that I'd been to, it was a place I was familiar with. And so it instantly got my attention in that way. And I wrote a, a piece, an op-ed piece for the New York Times connecting the idea of caste, the concept of caste to what had happened to Trayvon Martin. And one of the reasons it came to my attention and why I was able to make that connection was because uh, what, what happened to Trayvon Martin did not fit the, um, the expected black and white narrative that we've come to expect whenever there are attacks, for, for example, uh, um, racial attacks. And you know, the uh, George Zimmerman was of uh, Latin ex uh, uh, descent, and it, it, it was a different way of looking at a, uh, what I view as a continuing through line in our country's um, hierarchy. And in other words, this, the person who killed Trayvon Martin was in some ways acting as an enforcer of a hierarchy that we all had in, inherited. And thus that prompted me to uh, sort of awaken to the ways in which it was acting in our current era. And that was one of the first things that set me on the path toward this book. And then of course that was, that was, uh, that was uh, succeeded by uh, or followed by case after case, a metronome of videos, a metronome of names, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Jonathan Crawford, uh, Jonathan Farrell, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey, Brianna Taylor. There have been so many of these cases and there's case after case after case. And they seemed to me to be a reminder of the enduring hierarchy of what can be done to people who are, what is allowed to occur to people who are assigned to the very bottom of a hierarchy. And that is what set me on the path of doing a further investigation into a concept that I had brought up and explored language that I'd used in Walk of the Suns, but that required, in my view, a deeper investigation. Well, you know, the other thing, I mean, your, your book puts you know, put, puts forward this almost architectural, you use all this this language of sort of the house and its foundations, the tentacles of a, of a society that one is not able to extricate oneself from. You know, there's a systemic structural explanation and you also sort of describe yourself as being like a house inspector that has come to, to reveal that there is a, a very rotten foundation at the core of the home that we're trying to build in this country. Um, you know, I, I guess I think the other thing that's so striking to me about the book is that when one looks at the narrative around America and its racial inequality, there's this sense of you know the arc of justice. We're moving forward. We're 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 marching forward in some way despite the the problems. And then the, the list that you've just given among all the other people who are constantly limited and restricted by this rotting foundation illustrates that 
that you know despite this narrative that we may prefer as a country there is you know the system that exists and the structure that exists why has there been a reluctance do you think to talk about america as having a caste system as having a structural foundational um foundational perimeter i mean i, I think that I'm, I'm wondering why you think there has been that reluctance and and in a way that's one of the things about your book that was so striking to all of us who read it and have thought about it is is that it it, it reimagines also the way we the story that we tell to, our, to ourselves about our country so so i'm just curious about oh. the absence of the word caste in the in our in our discourse uh, I would say that uh, for a host of reasons. One is that it's language that we don't often apply to uh, to any place outside of the uh, more uh, familiar uh, iterations of, of caste. Obviously, uh, India is first to come to mind, and then also you might say feudal Europe um, uh, as as ways of understanding old, long-standing hierarchical hierarchical systems. And, uh, and yet, um, it had been the preserve of, of uh, anthropologists uh, and went into the Jim Crow South in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, they actually, interestingly enough, uh, went there uh, because there was, uh, in the North, there was a tremendous amount of interest in what was the reason for millions of, of African Americans defecting the Jim Crow South and coming to the North. Interestingly enough, it was the great migration that propelled uh, many of the, uh, of the social scientists who went into the Jim Crow South to understand what was going on. Uh, they could get funding because there was great urgency in understanding what was causing this great flood of people out of the South and into the North. And so they went in and, and the people, they actually risked their lives to go into the Jim Crow South, in particular, uh, those who were uh, African American, those who were black, one of the Jim Crow South, uh, had to risk their lives in order to study it because they had to act in accord with the protocols, expectations, customs uh, that were in, and laws uh, that were in place uh, that held an entire group uh, in subjugation, and they had to act uh, subservient. They had to act in a subordinated manner, which is against, of course, their uh, tremendous. Uh, uh, education and, and personal bearing. So they had to in some ways act the role of being subservient and subjugated in, in that world. And they, they spent, um, some of them spent years studying uh, the Jim Crow South, risking their lives, as I said, and uh, emerged from their research using the language of caste. Uh, these are people who lived it. These are people who studied it. Uh, but it remained in some ways in the purview of the academy. It, re it remained, uh, uh, they were writing obviously scholarly works. And uh, I, I came to become aware of their work in working on the warmth, researching the warmth of the suns. Uh, and that was uh, an, an effort to, um, to be able to uh, honor the, the uh, work that they had done by recognizing their contribution, but uh, not just to scholarship, but also to my own understanding uh, of the Jim Crow South as I was writing about it with the Warmth of the Suns. Um, I also would say that, you know, that it has come up time and time again from Charles Sumner, who made reference to it, uh, to Martin Luther King, who came to the recognition that uh, this was language, this was a concept that could be applied and could be uh, useful in understanding our own country's hierarchy. You know, he made this historic trip to India in 1959. Uh, he was greeted as a visiting dignitary upon arrival. He'd always wanted to go there because of, he'd been following the uh, nonviolent protest philosophy of Mohandas K. Gandhi. But when he got a chance to go there, he wanted to visit um, the southern part of the country. He wanted to visit um, with the people who were then known as untouchables, now known as Dalits. And upon arrival, the principal of the school he visited were very excited to, to greet him and introduce him to the students there. And so he said, young people, I wish to introduce you to a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. And when Dr. King heard that language, he first bristled at that description of himself. He did not see himself in that way at all. Um, he, again, as with most Americans, he, he thought that that is something that applied uh, to uh, you know, lands far, far away. He didn't see the connection to himself at all. In fact, he was quite peeved to be seen as someone who would be viewed as untouchable. And then he thought about it. He thought about what was at that time 40 uh, million, I'm sorry, at that time there were 20 million uh, 
uh, black people in the United States who were at that very moment being held in a fixed place, unable, not, not permitted to vote, not permitted to be part of the body politic, uh, being held in a fixed place, their occupations and their uh, access to the economy, they're excluded from the economy in many, many ways. And he thought about it, uh, the fact that the movement that he was then leading was being left uh, was being met with tremendous resistance, hostility, and in fact, violence. And he thought about it and he said to himself, I am an untouchable. And every black person in the United States is an untouchable too. So he came to the realization that most Americans would not have had uh, that, but, but he came to that realization because those who knew best what a caste system was, those who were living at the very bottom of the caste system in India, recognized the connection uh, of their system of hierarchy to our own and recognized who fit where in the hierarchy in the United States. And that's how he came to the awareness of that. Wayne, and you in your own writing and uh, of this of this book, you went to India and you and you attended, you know, events and, and spoke with people around the issue of how caste remains, of course, a really rigid system within a country like India and within South Asian diasporas as well. Um, you know, for you, you're, you know, in the, in the research and in the writing of this, it's both, I mean, it's both a journalistic and historical work, but it also has what reads to me sometimes like this feeling of a sermon that you're delivering. Like there's a real sense that you, you're kind of, I don't know, it feels to me like a really interdisciplinary work. Can I, can I ask you about how you thought about both the field reporting merging with this kind of message that you wished to deliver because it it has this the sense as i said of an of, a, of an address almost that you're giving to the reader well in some ways um you know you and i we had a chance to talk before and in talking with you before uh, the language of prayer you know came up in our, in our beautiful conversation actually and I, I view it as a you know it's not an argument but as a prayer a plea to to the country and in fact to humanity uh, to recognize uh, to recognize the divisions that we've inherited, and to recognize that you know, as with the old house that a person might inherit, um, you are not responsible. You did not create the une uneven pillars and joists and beams. Um, they were not your direct doing, but it is your responsibility once you take possession, once you uh, then uh, take possession of that which you have inherited. Then anything going forward is. Uh, your responsibility, and I, that, that's how I approach uh, the, the, the discussion of our country's history. And I looked at this as, uh, you know, as a way of shining a light onto what we otherwise might not see. And the process that I use with all of my work is interdisciplinary, um, you know, when you look at it from a research perspective. But I also think of it as in some ways, you know, weaving, you know, I feel as if I'm weaving a fabric uh, that will ultimately become uh, a, a single remnant, I'm collecting remnants of fabric that will, will be uh, pulled together to uh, stitch together a quilt that will uh, bring together many, many different perspectives, many ways of looking at a particular concept, um, many, many interviews, personal introspection, um, you know, the, the many, many ways that those who've gone before me have looked at the topic, whatever it is that I'm looking at, it's a, it's a massive quilt that I'm attempting to create with every work that I, that I, um, that I produce. And uh, I don't always know when I begin what the end result will look like. I don't know what that quilt is going to look like. And I might move the pieces around. I mean, I may, you know, stitch them together and then unravel it and put it back together so that it becomes, and what I view narrative nonfiction having the potential to be works of art. I mean, I believe that narrative nonfiction um, is the closest that many of us will ever get to being another person because narrative nonfiction is often driven by protagonists, it's driven by, from the ground up, from the perspective of individuals who are living a particular phenomenon. And so it requires going very deep into the, um, into the motivations, into the experiences, into the re responses that individuals may have to whatever the circumstances they may find themselves in, the phenomenon that they may be uh, att attempting to survive within. And um, it becomes the closest that you get to actually being another person because it pulls together the beauty of empathy building uh, 
uh, the empathy building that comes from fiction because you're you know making use of the approach and the uh, the tools of storytelling that that uh, novelists and, not, and fiction writers may use, but it's it's uh, based upon and dependent upon the research, uh, the fact-based, verifiable research that is necessary for nonfiction. And it's a weaving together of those two uh, so that you produce a work of narrative nonfiction that presumably or hopefully will pull the reader in, uh, allow that reader to almost be another person and uh, to uh, build empathy and perspective so that they can have a have a um, have an understanding of a, of a concept, understanding of a phenomenon from the inside out, from the ground up, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. And so that's the approach that I take. And uh, it takes a long time. First book took 15 years. I would say if it were a human being, it would it, it would be in high school and dating. That's how long the first book took. This book took uh, you know about half that time. So I'm 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 improving <laughs> when it comes to that. <laughs> Well, you know, the theme, the theme of this year's National Book Festival is open a book, um, open the world and open, you know, and I, and I wondered, you know, you've just described the sort of role of fiction in your own, in your own life. And of course, these books being world building in a way for yourself. I mean, you, you take such a long time to construct these and weave these. Um, what, what would you say about that theme of opening a book and opening the world? And, and particularly, I, I find that a very fitting message for this book, because it is, in fact, it includes the story of India and caste in India. It includes a world beyond America too, where where rigid systems of caste restrict people's outcomes and and life possibilities. So, the theme of opening a book and, and opening the world. I wonder what you, what you would make of that and how you would reflect on that. Yeah, well, I view libraries as vaults of knowledge, and uh, I also view them, especially in the era that we're in now as uh, an era in which many Americans are awakening to uh, a country that they did not truly get a chance to know through their formal education. You know, we, this is a golden age of uh, unfurling of perspectives that have not been uh, built into um, the ways that we, um, you know, the ways that history is taught um, in, in our country. And so I can say with, you know, The Walk of the Sons, for example, that uh, many people after that book came out would say to me, you know, I had no idea that this, these things happened in our country. I had no idea this happened in my region of the country, uh, whatever it may have been that they had no idea of. And so this is the, one of the reasons why libraries are so incredibly central and urgent now, because so many people are thirsty for, uh, for knowledge to understand what they might not have understood before, what they did not learn growing up. This is a, this is a time where people are hungering for answers because there is so much that has not often made sense to many people. And we often in the last few years have, have heard people say, I don't recognize my country. Uh, this, is not, uh, this is not America. This is not what America stands for. And whenever I hear that, I'm reminded that not enough of us know our country's true history. And that is one of the places, that is where libraries come in because libraries uh, to me uh, are the second wave of knowledge, the second wave of opportunity for people to learn what they did not know before. You know, we have an entire vault of knowledge available to people now at a moment where people have been thirsting more than ever to understand uh, things that may not have made sense otherwise. And, and so that's how I view, uh, I view libraries as in some ways the second wave of education for um, our entire society. Well, you know, this education that you're describing that America has been um, sort of quite bluntly at times enduring and experiencing and, and going through, which you know is, has been a very difficult process as well. And of course, any kind of awakening like this would be. Um, the term reckoning is, is often used for what we've been experiencing. And I remember reading your book last summer, you know, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and we were having all the monuments being pulled off of the pedestals, which had been debated for all these years. And suddenly in, in the midst of the reckoning, things have just taken on an urgency. And your work came out at the beginning of what felt like this 
popular cultural discussion. And now I think about all the things in our culture, you know, Clint Smith's new book that's just come out, the Underground Railroad adaptation that Barry Jenkins has released, things that, you know, frankly are long overdue assessments and, and reimagining of our history and thinking, not even reimagining, but, you know, finally reckoning with it. How do you think about, you know, this last year and especially the public education that we're having? It's it's uncomfortable, it's messy, it's often still very divisive. What 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 to how to kind of think as a, as a, as an American of the reckoning uh, now that we've had a year plus of this popular version of it? Well, it is is necessary. There's you know I, I have um, you know, there are many uh, metaphors in the book, as you know, and one of them that comes to mind for me right now is the idea that um, when you go to the doctor um, and you have an ailment. Uh, one of the first things that the doctor's office will hand you is a clipboard. And on that clipboard, there are many, 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 many questions that they want answered. And um, that is essentially taking inventory of your history. Um, oftentimes, uh, the doctor will not even begin to even examine you, much less come up with a diagnosis until the doctor knows your history. And we are, in this current era, been, have been made aware of the deep-seated divisions, fissures, ruptures that we are dealing with, it's all too evident. And, and that has called upon us to do an inventory to understand how we got to where we are. If, it's, if a doctor, if when we go to the doctor uh, for a single patient, um, it's necessary to know the history of that patient before even hazarding a guess uh, at a diagnosis, how much more essential is it to understand the history of a country um, before hazarding an effort toward uh, reconciling, reckoning, uh, or beginning to address and correct, overhaul, whatever it takes to fix what is wrong. And, and I, I think that it's not even an option, it's, it's, it's essential. And that, that's how I'm looking at it. Your book has a dedication to those who have broken caste that you've known, and you talk about this in the in the book as well. And it's one of the reasons I I, I continue to find it you know such an inspiring idea that one of the the gifts of having a reckoning is that then you have the opportunity to to change and, and the opportunity to hopefully break the systems that that we have at least to work toward breaking them. What does breaking caste mean to you, and and what can those of us who are are wishing to at least be able to reflect, but also hopefully progress from the state that we're born into? I mean, what, what does breaking caste mean to you? Well, breaking caste uh, requ uh, requires, from my perspective, uh, looking past the assigned roles that have, been, uh, that have been applied to each and every one of us. When you think about, um, for one thing, when you think about caste about an E, and you think about the rigidity of the apparatus that is you know, attached to an arm, when there are fractured bones cast, I mean, it keeps the bones rigid in a fixed place. You think about the cast of a play um, in which, you know, on that stage, you have someone stage right and stage left in the foreground and in the background. And that if, and that everyone on that stage knows the lines there to speak, and they know the place that they are to remain um, during that production. Cast without an E gives us a better sense of a clearer sense of what exactly uh, a, a caste system demands of people who are invested in maintaining it. And one of the things that that does is that if, if you think about the cast in a play, uh, those who know their lines and stick to their lines and they know when someone uh, is stepping out of their place in that play. And, then, and in that case, everyone might make adjustments or they may call that person out because that person has stepped out of the assigned role that everyone on the stage knows that person is supposed to remain in. And so one of the, there are many, many answers to the question that you've given, which is why I wrote the book, but um, you know, what, one of them is just an awareness of and a willing to, willingness to fight against uh, the uh, assumed roles that are assigned to all of us um, and to not be, to, to recognize that we all have been programmed uh, in expecting or assumptions, I mean, of who belongs where in the society. And once we recognize that we've been programmed to believe in these things, once we recognize that we ourselves have been programmed to act in a certain way in accord with 
uh, the assignment based upon our location, the location of the people of the group that we were born to and where that group is located in the hierarchy. Once we recognize that, that's one of the first, you know, the first ways of, of fighting something is to first recognize that you have something to fight for or against anyway. And so uh, recognizing it is the first step toward vanish, vanquishing it. And that was, that was the goal of this work is to first shine a light on us so that we can see beneath what we thought we might know about the hierarchy that, we've, uh, that we have inherited so that we can begin the work together uh, to uh, dismantle these hierarchies, to dismantle the inequities to, that are built into our society. And to recognize that each of us were born without any, you know, without our having done anything to this artificial arbitrary graded ranking of human value that determines one's standing, respect, benefit, the doubt, access to resources or denial of access to resources, you know, assumptions of competence and intelligence and worthiness, all of these things that we have inherited. And then that we then project onto others on the basis of the assumptions and stereotypes. And so that's just one out of many things because this is a structural issue. This is the infrastructure of our divisions and it requires, uh, an, it requires an inspection and overall of all of the systems within the uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, criminal justice, education, uh, law enforcement, uh, uh, housing, transportation, every single, every single system within our society has the uh, imprint of you know, centuries of inequities. They are built into the infrastructure of our country and it requires everything and everyone to overhaul, overturn these, uh, these embedded inherited divisions. And so there's not one answer to that, but the first one is awareness that it exists to begin with. Well, uh, before, we, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you, since we've been thinking in the National Book Festival around the idea of books over this particular year, I mean, you've had your book be out during the pandemic. Most of your events have been virtual from where you're, where you're joining us today. Um, how, has reading, how has reading been a part of your year and how have you turned to books now that you've finished your book? I, you may have already been writing another one. I'm not sure if that's already in progress. I would imagine it, it may be, but, but how has reading played a part in your own, in your own experience of this last year and, 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 of, and, of, and of maybe perhaps even a, a renewed sense of purpose of what writers do? Because your book has been a huge part of many of our year. Well, I have to say that I, that I think all of us are in a bubble and I'm in a bubble too. <laughs> and that bubble has been one where I could not have anticipated uh, how demanding this era that we're in would be. I could not have anticipated how this book would move out into the world. I could not have anticipated that essentially I would be um, uh, in some ways uh, engaged deeply with this one work day in and day out for months. I had no idea that this is what it was gonna be. I have literally been in uh, my own bubble dealing with this one thing uh, <laughs> almost nonstop. And uh, I had no idea how it was gonna be taken up by people uh, who have taken it upon themselves to give talks about this book. I mean, there've been times where we'll see something come up on, you know, on social media somewhere where a talk's being given at you know, Bryn Mawr or wherever it might be. And, I'll say to someone, I, we, my, do I, we have an event at Bryn Mawr on Tuesday and they'll say, no, no, that's, that's, that's not us, that's someone else. There are, there are talks being given um, uh, you know, every week. I, I have nothing to do with that. I mean, this is simply something that is occurring um, independent of anything that I might do. It has taken on a life of its own. I should also say that um, one of the you know, profoundly moving um, you know, uh, moments in the time since this book has been out is that, you know, it, it's, it's been on the bestseller list for since, since it's been out. I mean, which is just an astonishing thing. Um, but one thing that's significant it was, it, is it became number one only at one particular moment. It's been out all this time. It's been on the bestseller list for months, but only one week was it number one. One week and one week alone. And that was the week of the 2020 election. That was the only week. And I think that says something profound about the searching for understanding at a critical moment in our country's history. 
and how Americans um, turned to this book at that moment, that one moment, it was only number one, that one week, never before and never. Um, and that says that there was something that people were yearning to understand and they seem to be turning to this book to do so. Well, uh, it's been such an honor to speak to you a second time among many of the people who have, have had a chance to speak with you, the many people you have spoken to, the spin-off editions of cast that other people have had on their own. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's a book that has provided so much, so many of us understanding and reflection, and as you said, and prayers as well for a potential for another way of being. So uh, it's been a gift to speak with you. Thank you for joining the National Book Festival in 2021. Um, and again, Isabel Wilkerson, author of, of Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation. And now we'd like you to hear more from the library's own experts on this topic. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm joining you today from Mahogany Row in the Jefferson Building, one of the library's many historic spaces. I am Ryan Reft and I am a historian in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress. Library of Congress Manuscript Division holds what is perhaps the most extensive and comprehensive collection of personal papers and organizational records relating to American history and culture ever assembled, such as the papers of 23 presidents and three dozen Supreme Court justices, including recent members of the court, Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sandra Day O'Connor, and John Paul Stevens. Through the papers of Supreme Court justices held in the library's manuscript division, one can better grasp the legal structures that have worked to establish, maintain, and even dismantle racial inequality, or what Isabel Wilkerson discusses as caste in her book of the same title. The Supreme Court institutionalized segregation in its 1896 ruling Plessy v. Ferguson. Segregation's dismantling required decades of litigation brought by organizations like the NAACP and argued by attorneys such as Charles Hamilton Newsom and Thurgood Marshall and all sustained by a civil rights movement led by W.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and others, culminating in segregation's legal demise in 1954's Brown vs. Board of Education. After hearing the case, Chief Justice Earl Warren, as evidenced by these congratulatory notes from Justices William O. Douglas, Harold Burton, and Felix Frankfurter, all found in the Earl Warren papers, courted, charmed, and cajoled his fellow justice toward a unanimous decision. While the ruling does have its critics, Warren put forth in simple, straightforward language an opinion that both conveyed its gravity and could be easily reprinted in newspapers across the U.S. As Wilkerson notes in her interview, libraries offer us all a chance to build upon what we know about American history. While most Americans are aware of the famous Brown decision, an equally important aspect of the ruling followed a year later and often receives less attention. Though the Brown decision would, over time, reshape American institutions, its enforcement proved more difficult and complex, as represented by Justice Felix Frankfurter's draft decree to enforce the Brown v. Board of Education decision issued on April 8, 1955, from the Felix Frankfurter Papers. After the Brown opinion was announced, the court heard additional arguments during the following term on the decree for implementing the ruling. Frankfurter, knowing the preferences of his colleagues, used the phrase, with all deliberate speed. Seen here, written in Frankfurter's hand, just below the crossed out typescript to replace forthwith the word proposed by the NAACP's lawyers to achieve an accelerated desegregation timetable. Unfortunately, this phrasing made the work of integration invariably more difficult. In many places, opponents of desegregation used all deliberate speed as a legal justification refusing to fully integrate and in some cases forcing the closure of public school systems for years. The Brown decision undoubtedly remains a crucial part of America's jurisprudence but its implementation did not always equal its promise. The Felix Frankfurter Papers and the Earl Warren Papers represent just two of the 36 collections from justices of the Supreme Court, including Thurgood Marshall, as well as the over two dozen judges from the lower federal courts available to researchers in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress.